Hey guys, so today's video I'm going to be watching and reacting to the Meghan and Harry interview with Oprah. Um, but before we get into that, I do want to say a little thing. Um, I have, you know, loved the British history and British royals for a really long time. And as an American, I think we all kind of fairy tale-lize it and we don't really look at it really as like as critically as we really should. Um, but I do say that I'm going to go into this interview with the opinion that I think Megan went into this with a romanticized fairy tale lens on. She came into it being like, I'm gonna modernize it. I'm gonna Americanize it. It's gonna be so much better. Um, and as an American person, you, especially an actress, like you have so much free will, free reign, you could do whatever you want, doesn't matter. The royal family is very, very not like that. Like, even as someone who will never marry a prince, I know that if I were to ever get married to a royal, I could never speak what when I want to, say what I want to, interact with anybody in any type of way that I want to. I You have to dress a certain way, you have to speak a certain way, you have to curtsy a certain way, and you have to understand that these people you have to understand that these people are not people. They're people, but first they are the Queen of England, the Prince of England, a Prince of England. They are these people who are very, very, you know, high, like they're very old. They have a lot of, they have a lot of traditions. They have a lot of things that they have to live up to or live down. They have a lot of things that they answer to. It's not as easy as, you know, I, cut ribbons and I wave to people and I support charities it's really not that easy and there's so much more into it and there's so much more pressure and there's a whole lot of rules and I just don't think <clears throat> that Megan was prepared for any of that in any capacity I don't think she was prepared and it is the fault of the royal family for not doing more to prepare her but at the same time I also feel like yes they should have prepared her but at the same time, if you know that you're marrying into an institution like that, you should take your own steps to educate yourself. Like if it was me and I was about to go marry a prince, I would definitely have signed up for like some etiquette classes. Not saying she doesn't know how to act, but just, I don't know if there's specific rules for British people, I don't know. I would have maybe asked a palace staff member could you tutor me in like what this and that and this and that so that I'm going into it knowing more of the little things than not. But I also feel like Diana could have done that. But let's not talk about that. I feel like that's a bigger controversy than I'm willing to undertake. <laughs> so let's get into this interview. And my laptop died overnight. So I'm charging it, but my card is not very long. But I want to be comfortable when I settle in for this interview. So let's see how this works out. Okay, I'm ready. It's a commercial because I'm watching it afterwards. And I bought Paramount Plus just to watch this interview and I'm definitely going to cancel it after this. Because I already have Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Disney Plus, and HBO Max. I don't need another one. I shouldn't ever need another one. And just to be fully honest, I have seen a couple clips of some of the things that are said in this interview, but I haven't seen the whole interview. So let's, let me stop yabbering. Okay. Nearly two billion people around the globe watched their wedding. From the outside, it looked like something out of a fairy tale and appeared to signal a new day for the modern British monarchy. This couple represents everything they will consult. Okay. Not even a whole minute in yet. 
I feel like that's also part of the problem is because she married in and immediately people were like, oh my God, she's going to she's gonna change the monarchy. The monarchy is going to be changed forever. And that was a lot of added pressure that she probably did not need because she already was going to be not the first American to marry into the family, but the first American, the first American divorcee that was going to marry into the family and be an active working royal. Um, what was her name? Wilson? Wilson something? I, I don't know. I don't care about her. The one that Elizabeth's dad's brother abdicated the throne for, whatever her fucking name is. Um, she was an American divorcee, but he had to abdicate the throne to marry her. It is not at all the same situation because Harry chose to leave. He wasn't forced out in the way that Edward was. So I feel like they already put too much pressure on her and on them as a couple right from the jump because they were like, oh, they're, she's going to change so much. She's going to do so much. She don't need that added pressure. Marrying into this family was already a big enough pressure. She didn't need that. I think off the bat, that's where I started to go wrong. It's a wonderful fairy tale. It's, it's so they became one of the most talked about couples in the media. Then in January 2020, there's been an almost shockingly quick turnaround. Harry and Meghan stunned the world when they decided to step back as senior members of the royal family. Meghan seems to have moved from the nation's heroine to the nation's villain. Tonight, for the first time, they tell their story. I'm sitting down with Megan. I think what we really have got to clear up here is that you, Megan, are the one who manipulated, calculated this Megxit. And later, Harry joins us. What was the tipping point? Did you blindside the queen? Hi, girls. I also visit them at home, where they're beginning their new life in America. I'm sorry but also i think it's just really really incredibly stupid that a prince of england would move to america because as much as americans like to talk up america is so great we're really fucking not like has our response to covid taught y'all nothing we're really fucking not and i don't know why somebody coming from a more advanced country like the uk would then leave it to come to america because you can't i mean america's not where it's at really like honest to god it's not but whatever I would love to move to England and, and live there. Oh, I'm having a baby. Having a baby. That's more than a bump. I know. Wow. I know. Oh that was a hug, virtual I hug. Know. Yeah, distance hug. So you know, we're we we, we can't hug because we're practicing all doing, the things. Doing all the things. We've been so strict. Everybody around here literally is double masked and has face shields but you look lovely thank you so do you pregnant and lovely thank you yes do you know if you're having a boy or girl we do this time i will wait for my husband to join us and we can share that with you okay that would be really great <laughs> i can't wait to hear so before we okay so i've seen she was on an episode of like i think it was law and order or maybe it was criminal minds it was one of those law crime shows and I swear to God, I don't remember her speaking that way. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just I don't remember her, like the sound of her voice being that way. I really like the way she sounds right now. Like it's just the sound of her voice seems very like calming and calm and respectful. And I'm just like, I don't remember that she sounded that way on TV. Maybe that's her just being a good actress. I don't know. I'm going to shut up. I'm sorry get into it <laughs> yeah i just want to make it clear to everybody that uh even though we're neighbors down the i'm down the road you're up the road yeah this uh, isn't my house this, this isn't your is, house this is my house we're using a friend's house because they had a very nice beautiful uh, yeah. um that there has not been an agreement you don't know what i'm going to ask no. and there is no subject that's off limits no. and you are not getting paid for this interview. All of that's correct. All of that is correct. So, you ready? She's not getting paid? Yeah, I, I thought that was it. I thought we were done now. <laughs> I just want to ask about the baby. <laughs> okay. But I remember sitting 
in the chapel. And thanks for inviting me, by the way. You're welcome. So I was there on that wedding day, and I so recall this sense of magic. I mean, I, I'd never experienced anything like it. And you, when you came through that door, it seemed like you were like floating down the aisle. Were you even inside your body at that time? I thought about this a lot because it was like having an out-of-body experience that I was very present for. And that's the only way I can describe it because the night before I slept through the night mm -hmm. entirely, which in and of itself is a bit of a miracle. Um, and then woke up and started listening to that song, going to the chapel uh. <laughs> and, and just tried to make it fun and light and remind ourselves that this was our day. But I think we were both really aware, even in advance of that, this, this wasn't mm -hmm. our day. This was the day that was planned for the world. Everybody who gets married knows that you are really marrying the family too. Mm -hmm. But you weren't just marrying the family, family. You're, you're marrying, marrying family. a 1200 year old institution. Mm -hmm. You're marrying the monarchy. What did you think it was going to be like? I will say I went into it naively mm -hmm. because I didn't grow up knowing much about the royal family. It wasn't something that was part of conversation at home. It wasn't something that we followed. My mom even said to me a couple months ago, she said, did, did Diana ever do an interview? Now, now I can say, yes, a, a very famous one, but my mom doesn't even know that, right? Mm -hmm. But you were certainly no. aware yeah. of the royals. Of course. And if you're going to marry a royal, then you would do research about what that would mean. Well, I didn't do any research about you what that would mean. didn't do any research? No. I've never looked up my husband online. I just didn't feel a need to because... Okay. So that, I feel was really irresponsible of her because yes you should have looked up your husband not in a creepy stalker way but like if you know that he's famous he has a famous family you want to look into that because you want to know what you're marrying into that's also she went a little wrong right there she should have done the research because everything that i needed to know he was sharing with me right everything that we thought i needed to know he was telling me so you didn't have a conversation with yourself or talking to your friends or thinking about what it's like what it would be like to marry a prince who is harry who you had fallen in love with mm -hmm. and what it would mean to be a part of that family you, you didn't give it a lot of thought no we thought about what we thought it might be yeah which is, that's what, that's what I'm yeah, trying to Yeah, I mean, like, I didn't fully understand what the job was, mm -hmm. right? What, is, what does it mean to be a working royal? What do you do? What does that mean? I knew that he and I were very aligned on all of our cause-driven work. Mm -hmm. That was part of our initial connection um, and what we talked about in our, the beginning of our courtship. But I think there was no way to understand what the day-to-day -day was going to be like. Yeah. And it's so different because I didn't romanticize any element of it but i think as americans especially what do you know about mm -hmm. the royals it's what you read in fairy tales right you think is what you know about the royals right, right? so it's yep. easy to True. have an image of it that is so far from from reality and that's what was really tricky over those past few years is when the perception and the reality are two very different things and you're being judged on the perception but you're living the reality of it mm -hmm there's a complete misalignment and there's no way to explain that to people. Well, you know, in every family, I think things get serious mm -hmm. when you are brought in to meet the mother or the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And in everybody's family, who's watching right now, you yes. know, the grandmother is the matriarch mm -hmm. uh, and known in many families His as grandmother the queen. His grandmother's the queen. <laughs> yeah. And the literal she queen. she was one of the first people I met. I in her your first. situation, it's the queen. The real queen. The real queen yes. that you're, you're, you're meeting. And, what was that like? Were you worried about making the right impression? Um, there wasn't actually a huge formality the first time I met um, Her Majesty the Queen. I, we were going to lunch at Royal Lodge, uh, which is where some other members of the family live, specifically Andrew and mm -hmm. Fergie and um, Eugenie and Beatrice would spend a lot of time there. And Eugenie and I had known each other before I had known Harry. So that was comfortable and we were, were friends with them as a couple um and then it turned out the queen was finishing a church service 
there in Windsor. And so she was going to be at the house. And I remember Harry and I are in the car and he says, okay, well, my, my grandmother's there, so you're going to meet her. Oh, great. I love grandpa. I loved my grandmother. I used to take care of my grandma. This is great. He goes, right, do you know how to curtsy? What? He said, do you know how to curtsy? Now, I thought genuinely that that was what happens outside. Yeah. I thought that was part of the fanfare. Or, uh -huh. I didn't think that's what happens inside. And yeah. I said, but it's your grandmother. He goes, it's the queen. Wow. And that was really the first moment mm -hmm. that the penny dropped, that this wasn't, it was easy for me up until then so to then go. So then did you Google how to curtsy? No, we were in the car. Okay. <laughs> we were in the car for five minutes. How does driving. one curtsy? Yes. Deeply um, to show respect. Mm -hmm. And I learned it very quickly. <laughs> right in front of the house. We just practiced and then walked in. And you and Harry practiced. Yeah, and Fergie ran out and she said, are you ready? Do you know how to curtsy? I said, oh my goodness, you guys. Um, and so I practiced really quickly and we went in and I met her and apparently I did a very deep curtsy and <laughs> I don't remember it. And then we just sat there and we chatted and, um, and it was lovely and easy and, and I think Thank God I hadn't known a lot about the family. Thank God I hadn't researched. I would have been so in my head about all of it. Mm. I would have had it. I, so you're you're basically what you're sharing with us is that you you were no more nervous than the regular person who goes to meet somebody's grandmother. You you weren't that intimidated because it was yeah, the queen. I think it's I think it's two things. It's I had confused the idea of I thought well, I grew up in L.A. You see celebrities all the time. Mm -hmm. This is not the same, right? But it's very easy, I think, especially as an American to go, oh, these are famous people. It's like, no, this is, this is a completely different yeah. ball game. Were you silent or were you silenced? Adventure is calling. Commercial. So I will say that that is true. I think a lot of times if you go to visit England and you're like, oh, it's just the queen, she's just a celebrity. She's not a celebrity. It's it's a political celebrityness. Like, you know how you see politicians and you're just like, oh my gosh, I know who that is. Where it's like they have the glamour of being a celebrity, but they're a politician. You know, they're a working individual and they're here to do a job, you know, that they... And I'm not saying you need to respect your politicians, but it's just like they have a job to do. They need the job to do. They need you to let them do that job. That's kind of what the royals are like. They're doing a job. It's not so much. It's not really for the fanfare. And that's where I think she she just admitted she got that part confused. Like she thought it was just a lot of fanfare when it's no, this is a job that comes with a lot of respect and a lot of duties that you have to take very, very seriously. Proban 24 doesn't just sanitize and stop. It keeps killing bacteria for 24 hours. Spray on hard surfaces to kill 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria initially, including the COVID-19 virus. Once dry, Microban forms a shield that keeps killing bacteria for 24 hours, touch after touch. Don't just sanitize. Keep killing bacteria for 24 hours with Microban 24. Who could have known that extra love could add extra pounds? That all those accidents could have a medical explanation? Or that the smallest changes could make the biggest impact? You did, and so did we. That's why Hills always starts with a pet's biology to anticipate their ever-changing nutritional needs for differences you can see, feel, and trust. So you're always a step ahead. What's the word? Peace. Peace. Yeah. The day after our interview, I stopped over to Harry and Megan's new home. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi. Yeah, guy's been, guy's been through everything with me. Yeah, he, I mean, from the beginning, from the very first day. Yeah. Guy, I mean, I had him in Canada. I got him from a kill shelter in Kentucky. Yeah. Hi, girls. We put on our wellies to feed the hens, Megan and Harry recently rescued from a factory farm. I love your little designer house. Archie's chicken. Oh, how cute is that? She's always wanting chickens. 
But you know, I just love rescuing. So this is a part of your new life. What are you most excited about? Okay, I hear my cat making noise. And I'm back. My cat likes to knock things over and distract me. What are you most excited about in the new life? What are you most excited about? I think just being able to live authentically, mm -hmm. right? Like this kind of stuff, it's so, it's so basic, but it's really fulfilling. And just getting back down to basics. I mean, I just think about it, even our wedding, you know, three days before our wedding, we got married. Ah. No one knows that, but we called the archbishop and we just said, look, this thing, this spectacle is for the world, but we want our union between us. So like the vows that we have framed in our room are just the two of us in our backyard with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And, oh. and that was the piece that- Just the three of us. Just the three of us. Just the three of us. You know, the wedding was the most perfect picture, you know, anybody has ever seen. But through that picture that we were all seeing behind the scenes, there was a lot of criticism on the wedding, so I wouldn't say perfect to everybody. On. And soon after your marriage, the tabloids started offering stories that painted a not so flattering picture of you in your new world. There were rumors about you being Hurricane Megan. I hadn't heard that. Okay. So there were rumors about you being Hurricane Megan. Uh, for the departure of several high-profile palace staff members. Mm -hmm. And there was also a story, did you hear this one, about you making Kate Middleton cry? This I heard about. You heard about that? Okay. This was, that was a, that was a turning point. That was a turning point? Yeah. Six months after Harry and Meghan's wedding, headlines began to swirl about a rift between Meghan and her sister-in-law the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton. It was reported that Meghan had left Kate in tears over the bride-to-be's strict demands over flower girl dresses. The narrative with, with Kate, which didn't happen, was really, really difficult and something that, I think that's when everything changed, really. You say the narrative with Kate, it didn't happen. Mm. So specifically, did you make Kate cry? No. So where did that come from? Was there a situation where she might have cried or she could have no, cried? No, the reverse happened. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone because it was a really hard week of the wedding and she was upset about something, but she owned it and she apologized and she brought me flowers and a note apologizing. She did what I would do if I knew that I hurt someone right to just take accountability for it what was shocking was mm -hmm. what was that six seven months after our wedding mm -hmm. that the reverse of that would be out in the world the story came out six seven seven months after it actually happened yeah so when you I said have, i would have never wanted that to come out about her ever even though it had happened i protected that from ever being out in the world so when you say the reverse happened explain to us what you mean by that maybe if you don't get a few days before the wedding, she was upset about something pertaining to, yes, the issue was correct about the flower girl dresses. And it made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. And I thought in the context of everything else that was going on in those days leading to the wedding, that it didn't make sense to not be just doing whatever what everyone else was doing, which was trying to be supportive, knowing what was going on with my dad and whatnot. This was a really big story at the time that mm. you made Kate cry. Now you're saying you didn't make Kate cry, Kate made you cry. Okay. So one thing, I feel like, yeah, it would have been really inappropriate for either woman to be so upset about a flower girl dress that one of them would be upset enough to where they had to cry. I think it is worse that the bride would start crying because somebody else is just so fresh about something as trivial as a dress. But at the same time, the way the royal family is, it needs to look a certain way and it needs to be perfect. So I can understand that maybe Kate was feeling the pressure to make sure it looked perfect, but so was Megan. So I feel like that's whatever. 
but yeah but also she hates being called kate she has never once called herself kate her name is Catherine. Catherine. okay okay so we all want to know what would make you cry what why what were you going through you were going through all of the anxiety that brides go through putting their wedding together mm -hmm and going through all of the issues with your father was he coming was he not coming mm. and there was a confrontation over the the dresses there wasn't a confrontation and i actually think it's i don't think it's fair to her to get into the details of that because she apologized okay. and i've forgiven her right mm -hmm. what was hard to get over was being blamed for something that not only i didn't do but that happened to me and and the people who were part of our wedding going to our comms team and saying i know this didn't happen i don't have to tell them what actually happened okay. but i can at least go on the record and say she didn't make her cry and they were all told to so say so all the time the stories out that you had made kate cry you knew all along and people around you knew that that wasn't true everyone in the institution knew it wasn't so true. why didn't somebody just say that it's a good question I'm not sharing that piece about Kate in any way to be disparaging to her. I think it's really important for people to understand the truth. Okay. But also I think a lot of it that was fed into by the media, and look, I, I would hope that she would have wanted that corrected. And maybe in the same way that the palace wouldn't let anybody else yeah. negate it, they wouldn't let her because she's a good person. And I think so much of what I have seen play out is this idea of polarity, where if you love me, you don't have to hate her. And if you mm -hmm. love her, you don't need to hate me. Mm -hmm. You know, there were several stories that compared headlines written about you to those written about Kate. Mm -hmm. um, since you don't read things, let me just tell you <laughs> what was said. Okay. Uh, there were stories where Kate was being praised for holding her baby bump. Oh gosh, have I done it since we've been sitting yes, down? You've probably? been doing it the whole time. Uh, <laughs> Kate was praised for cradling her baby bump. And the headline about you doing the same thing said, Megan can't keep hands off her baby bump for pride or vanity. What does it have to do with pride or vanity? Well, I'm just I'm just telling you about the stories. Okay. Okay. I hear you. And there, there, there was a whole online uh, that is ridiculous piece though. about this. Kate eating avocados to help with morning sickness. <laughs> oh, I heard. Okay, I heard about the avocado. Okay, but you were eating avocados. <laughs> And fueling uh, murder, apparently. Yeah, wolfing down a fruit linked to water shortages, illegal deforestation, and environmental devastation. There was se there seems to be there was a that's a really loaded piece of toast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you you have to laugh at a certain point because it's just ridiculous. That's good. That's a loaded piece of toast. It's about deforestation. Oh, man. oh wow. So do you think there was a standard for Kate in general and a separate one for you? And if so, why? Um, I don't know why. I can see now what layers were at play there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they really seem to want a narrative of a hero and a villain. Yeah, you came in as the first mixed race person to marry into the family. And did that concern you in being able to fit in? Design is not just for designers. It's for everyone. With Canva, anyone can create, customize, and share a design in just a few clicks. Start designing for free at Canva.com. I will admit that the way the media's articles are written, it's very blatantly anti Megan for like zero reason because at the beginning there was no reason to. Like, really. Like, I could understand why the media would run with Megan being the villain after the article came out about her making Catherine cry because that's a good strong narrative to keep going with if you're trying to sell papers. But before that, I don't know why they would have been doing that. But I'm not a reporter, I don't decide those things. 
There's a way. There are two ways to sell your house. The easiest way is selling it to Open Door. The other way is selling it yourself. You're gonna have to pay it over that. Oh wow, that's um, and have a lot of visitors in your home. Is it tow for me? I don't know what's that. Like. Let's not talk about that way. Let's talk Why about the Open Door. Why do All you have to do is go to OpenDoor.com. Tell us a little bit about your house, and you'll get a competitive offer in a few steps. So, what do you think? Well, I'm sold. We're sold. Get your free offer at OpenDoor.com. In 1992, Eric, Kevin, Julie, Becky, Andre, Norman, and Heather stopped being polite and got real. Did you call me a racist? Yes, you are. Now in 2021, we are officially re roommates. The original Seven Strangers are getting real again. We are be party again. We're still having the same conversations. It's going to sound, again, racist, but... Please don't say it. We are back, baby. I don't know. I couldn't watch that on the thing. But I've never watched the real world, the originals, anyway. So, Or Big Brother or The Bachelor. I'm not into those shows. You came in as an American. You came as, in as an actress. You came in as a divorcee. You came in as an independent woman. You came in as the first mixed race person to marry into the family. And yours was a different story. Mm. And did that concern you in, in 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 being able to fit in did, did you think about that at all well I thought about it because they made me think about it mm. right but I think at the same time now upon reflection thank god all of those things were true thank god I had that life experience thank god I had known the value of working my first job was when I was 13 at a frozen yogurt shop called Humphrey Yogurt um <laughs> I've always worked. I've always valued independence. I've always been outspoken, especially about women's rights. I mean, that's the sad irony of the last four years is I've advocated for so long for women to use their voice. And then I was silent. Uh, were you silent or were you silenced? The latter. So how does that work? were you told okay so again like i said at the beginning as an american you have the free reign and a private citizen american you have the free reign to say whatever you want any opinion you want about any political figure any royal family in the world whatever point blank you can do it you can say it nobody can fuck nobody can stop you unless you're in russia and putin hears you and he has you arrested same with North Korea or Saudi Arabia, right? But you could say it from the safety of America. Just don't get caught. <laughs> but once you become part of that institution, you do not have that same freedom. So the royal family cannot be political. That's a thing. They can't be political because they could sway the vote. They could sway a vote any way, which is why they're not allowed to be political. They are just there to sign off on the laws, whether they agree with those laws or not. So marrying into that, she didn't have that freedom to be an advocate for feminism, women's rights, for political stuff, for, you know, moving forward with political gun control, none of that stuff. She can't have a public opinion on it as a royal. It's not that she was silenced. It's that none of the royal family members can publicly have that opinion. You can privately have that opinion, have that opinion with your family, have that opinion with your friends, but you cannot publicly have that opinion. Why is that confusing? Okay. By the comms people or the, I don't know, the institution, the, were, were you told to keep silent? How were you told to handle tabloids or gossip? Were you were you told to say nothing? Everyone from everyone in my world um, was given very clear directive from the moment the world knew Harry and I were dating to always say no comment. So that's my friends, my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. um, we did. Mm -hmm. I did anything they told me to do. Of course I did, because it was also through the lens of, and we'll protect you. So even as things started to roll out in the media, 
that I didn't see, but my friends would call me and say, Meg, this is really bad. Because I didn't see it, I'd go, don't worry, I'm being protected. Oh. I believed that. And, and I think that was, that was really hard to reconcile because it was only, it was only once we were married and everything started to really worsen that I came to understand that not only was I not being protected, but that they were willing to lie to protect other members of the family, but they weren't willing to tell the truth to protect me and my husband. So are you saying you did not feel supported by the powers that be, be that the firm, the monarchy, all of them? Um, it's hard for people to distinguish the two because there's it, it's a family business, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the family and then there's the people that are running the institution. Those are two separate things and it's important to be able to compartmentalize that because the queen, for example, has always been wonderful to me. I mean, we had one of our first joint engagement together. She asked me to join her. And Is I was on the train? Yeah, on the yeah. train. And we had breakfast together that morning and she'd given me a beautiful gift and I just really loved being in her company. And I remember we were in the car. Can you share what the gift was? Or? Yes, she gave me um, some beautiful pearl earrings and a matching necklace. And um, we were in the car going between engagements and she has a blanket that sits across her, her knees for warmth and it was chilly and she was like Megan come on and put it over my knees as well oh, right nice. like just moments of and it made me think of my grandmother where she's always been warm and inviting and and really welcoming so okay so she made you feel welcome yes. did you feel welcomed by everyone it seemed like you and Kate at the Wimbledon game where you were going to watch a friend play tennis <laughs> was it what it looked like you are two sister-in-laws out there in the world, mm -hmm. getting to know each other. Was she helping you, embracing you into the family, helping you adjust? I think everyone welcomed me. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, and, mo and when you say, was it what it looked like? My understanding and my experience of the past four years is it's nothing like what it looks like. It's nothing like what it looks like. And I and I remember so often people within the firm would say, well, you can't do this because it'll look like that. You can't, so even, can I go and have lunch with my friends? No, 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 you're oversaturated, you're everywhere. It would be best for you to not go out to lunch with your friends. I go, well, I haven't, I haven't left the house in months. I mean, there was a day that one of the members of the family, she came over and she said, why don't you just lay low for a little while? Because you are everywhere right now. And I said, I've left the house twice in four months. I'm everywhere, but I am nowhere. And from that standpoint, I continue to say to people, I know there's an obsession with how things look, but has anyone talked about how it feels? Because right now I could not feel lonelier. Hmm. You're feeling lonely, even though you're the your prince, you're in love, you're with him. I'm not lonely. I wasn't lonely with him. Okay. So I really do understand that because a lot of the news articles that were coming out was the same story just told over and over or in different ways. Or it's like they were like, oh, a secret insider told us this, this, this. But <clears throat> you hadn't seen her really do anything. So I can fully believe that she was just in the house. But like the stories just kept pumping and pumping and pumping out. And to look a certain way or to try to get it to die down, people were like, oh, maybe just don't go out. She was like, but I haven't been out in forever. But that didn't stop the media from running all of these crazy stories. And yeah, there are moments that he had to work or he had to go away. This was moments in the middle of the night. And so there was very little that I was allowed to do and so, yeah, of course that breeds loneliness when you've come from such a full life or when you've come from freedom. I think the easiest way that now people can understand it is what we've all gone through in lockdown. Yeah, well, everybody can certainly relate now. In those months when I was pregnant, all around the same time, 
So we have in tandem the conversation of he won't be given security, he's not going to be given a title, and also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Okay, this Paramount Plus, their commercials are crazy long. Like, crazy long. If you knock over my... Cat trying to give me a heart attack. Anyway. So, I can fully believe that a member of the royal family said that about how dark Archie's skin color may be. Stop. Um, I do kind of think it was either Prince Philip or Charles because they're the only ones I could ever really see saying that. Um, Prince Charles because he's the oldest, comes from a, like an old decade. And he's been known to just have no filter and he'll just say whatever, whenever. And Charles because I feel like we all know Charles is not that great of a guy and I feel like that's kind of a thing. But I just want to touch on the whole skin color thing because Megan is half black right so then archie is only three fifths black so he's probably not going to be that dark in actuality but there have been stories of two white people having a fully black baby because they have ancestors that were black that married white people and blah 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 and down and down and down so realistically the chances are he was probably going archie was probably going to be really light-skinned which he is or he was going to be really dark why it should matter which one of that it is it shouldn't but i don't understand why there would have been a question about it because obviously he was you i mean i guess with my basic understanding of biology he was going to be light unless you know he really took after an old ancestor of megan's like i mean why is that why was that a concern that needed to be spoken into the universe i don't understand <sighs> This is Paramount Plus, now streaming. Don't do it. Not many people have asked if I'm okay, but it's, um... I guess I've just never heard her talk thing before. To be going through behind the scenes. And the answer is, would it be fair to say not really okay? I mean, it's really been a struggle. Yes. Well, I would have to say in South Africa when the reporter stopped and asked are you okay mm. and oof, we all felt that why did that question strike About such a nerve like... what was going on with you internally at that time that was the last day of the tour you know those tours are I'm sure they have beautiful pictures and it looks vibrant and all of that is true it's also really exhausting so I was fried and I think it just hit me so hard because we were making it look like a I think that's an everybody thing though because a lot of times people don't ask you how are you and expect a real answer like how many times have you been asked to work oh how are you and like whether you say good or bad the answer is the same oh okay and they're gonna keep going like I think that's a universal people thing because people don't really care how you are. And if you give an honest answer about that you're not doing okay, people care even less, so. Everything was fine. I can understand why people were really surprised to see that there was pain there mm -hmm. because we were doing our job. Our job was to be on and to smile. And so when he asked me that, um, I guess I had felt that it had never occurred to anyone that I that I wasn't okay and that I had really been suffering and I had known for a long time and had been asking the institution for help for quite a, a long time. Help from what? Um, after we had gotten back from our Australia tour, which was about a year before that, um, and we talked about when things really started to turn, when I knew we weren't being protected. Mm -hmm. It was during that part of my pregnancy, especially, that I started to understand what our continued reality was going to look like. What kind of protection did you want that you feel you didn't receive? I mean, they 
would go on the record and negate the most ridiculous story for anyone, right? If I'm talking about things that are super artificial and mm -hmm. inconsequential. But the narrative about, you know, making Kate cry, I think was the beginning of a real character assassination and they knew it wasn't true. And I thought, well, if they're not going to kill things like that, then what are we going to do? Separate from that, what was happening behind closed doors was, you know, we knew I was pregnant. We now know it's Archie um, and it was a boy. We didn't know any of that at the time. We can just talk about it as Archie now. And that was when they were saying they didn't want him to be a prince or a princess, not knowing what the gender would be, which would be different from protocol, and that he wasn't going to receive security. What? Okay, so I know from a clip that I've seen that Megan is going to elaborate later on, but I feel like I should do that now. Um, so technically the grandchildren of the monarch are the ones that are automatically given titles at birth. So the monarch is Queen Elizabeth. So her son Charles is automatically born Prince of Wales, whatever. And then his kids, Harry and Harry and William, my phone cut out. But as I was saying, it is only the immediate grandchildren of the monarch that are given titles. And George was given the title because he is literally the third person in line for the throne. So it goes Charles, William, George. And then when Charlotte was born, she technically was not supposed to get a title because she's just the great grandchild of the monarch and she's not the next person that's gonna be the monarch. But they did change the rules so that they could give Charlotte the title of princess. And they continued the change when they gave Louis the title of prince. So technically to the, to the just base tradition, Archie is not automatically supposed to get this title. But because they changed the rules for Charlotte and Louis, and Louis, Louis Louis, bleh, he could and should have been given a title. But the media led us to believe that Meghan and Harry chose that, but apparently the, they just didn't want to give him one, which does sound very racist. Like, why would you give two great grandchildren titles, but then not the other one? But I just want to point out the logistics, technically, technically speaking, he is not entitled to one, but Charlotte was not and Louis was not either. That does not make it not racist that they bend the rules for one, but not the other. Just, okay. I'm ready. Me. Well, also, I know she's going to say something, but um, when Charles becomes king, all of his grandkids then automatically get titles. So eventually Archie's going to get a title. I think she goes on to say that they said they were going to change that or they were going to try to change that. And I'm like, well, that then you're just being inherently racist. He wasn't going to receive security. This went on for the last few months of our pregnancy where I'm going, hold on a second. That your son and Harry, Prince Harry's son, were, was not going to receive security? That's right. I know. How, how, but how does that work? How does that work? It's like, no, no, no. It, it, because if he's not going to be a prince, it's like, okay, well, he needs to be safe. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying don't make him a prince or a princess, whatever it's going to be. But if you're saying the title is what's going to affect their protection, we haven't created this monster machine I feel like I'm out of around frame now. us in terms of clickbait and tabloid fodder. You've allowed that to happen, which means our son needs to be safe. So how do they explain to you that your son, the grandson, the great-grandson of the queen mm -hmm. is not going to have, he wasn't going to be a prince. How do they tell you that? And what reasons did they give and then say and so therefore you're not you don't need protection there, there's no explanation hmm. there's no version i mean that's the other piece who of tells it. you that um i heard a lot of it through harry and then other parts of it through conversations with family members um and it was a decision that they felt was appropriate and i thought well 
What in the title was him being called a prince? Archie being called a prince, was that important? Oops. Because then he was going to be safe in the course. All the grandeur surrounding this stuff is an attachment that I don't personally have, right? I've been a waitress, an actress, princess, a duchess. I've always just still been Megan, right? So for me, I'm clear on who I am, independent of that stuff. And the most important title I will ever have is mom. I know that. Um, but the idea of our son not being safe and also the idea of the first member of color in this family not being titled in the same way that other grandchildren would be, you know, the other people. Sorry, that's the group chat. The group chat's gone off. Is that conversation is there's a convention, I don't know if it's George V or George VI convention that when you're the grandchild of the monarch, so when Harry's dad becomes king, automatically Archie and our next baby would become prince or princess or whatever they're going to be. So for you, it's about protection and safety, not so much as what the, what the title Means That's a huge more. piece of it, but but I mean, but the, 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 and that having the title gives you the safety and protection. Yeah, but also it's not their right to take it away. Yeah. Right. And so I think even with that convention I'm talking about, while I was pregnant, they said they want to change the convention for Archie. Mm. Well, why? Did you get an answer? No. You still don't have an answer. No. You know, we had heard the world, the, those of us out here reading the things or hearing the things, that it was you and Harry who didn't want. Archie to have a prince title. So you, you're telling me that is not true. No, and it's not our decision to make. Okay, my phone is annoying me. Sorry, when my phone died, I put it back on my tripod in the wrong way and it messed up the frame and it was bothering me. Okay, hopefully that's the last interruption. Hey, right, I even though I have a lot of clarity on what comes with the titles, good and bad, and from my experience, a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. I, again, wouldn't wish pain on my child, but that is their birthright to then make a choice about. Okay, so it feels to me like things started to change when you and Harry decided that you were not going to take the picture that had been a part of the tradition for years. And we weren't asked to take a picture. That's also part of the spin that was really damaging. I thought, can you just tell them the truth? Can you say to the world, you're not giving him a title and we want to keep him safe? And that if he's not a prince, then it's not part of the tradition? Just tell people and then they'll understand. Mm -hmm. but, but they wouldn't do that. But you were, you both obviously were aware that that had been a part of the tradition. And there was a, was there a specific reason why you didn't want to be a part of that tradition. I think many people interpreted that as you were both saying, we're gonna do things our way, or we're gonna do things in a different way. That's not it at all. I mean, I think what was really hard, so picture now that you know what was going on behind the scenes, right? There was a lot of fear surrounding it. I was very scared of having to offer up our baby, knowing that they weren't going to be kept safe. You certainly must have had some conversations with Harry about it and had your own suspicions as to why they didn't want to make Archie a prince. What are, what are those thoughts? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because of his race? And, and I know that's a loaded question, but... But I can give you an honest answer. In those months when I was pregnant, all around this same time, so we had in tandem the conversation of, he won't be given security, he's not gonna be given a title. And also concerns and conversations mm -hmm. about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? And who? Who is having that conversation with you? What? So, um... There is a conversation, hold up, hold up. There's Stop several, right con now. There are several conversations. There's a conversation with you? With Harry. About 
how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially, and what that would mean or look like. Ooh. And you're not going to tell me who had the conversation? I think that would be very damaging to them. Okay. So how, how does one have that meeting? <laughs> that was relayed to me from Harry. Those were conversations mm -hmm. that family had with him. And I think... Well, here, real one for um, letting her know about it, though. Whoa. It was really hard to be able to see those as compartmentalized they were conversations. concerned that if you were to brown, that that would be a problem. Are you saying that? I wasn't able to follow up with why, but that if that's the assumption you're making, I think that feels like a pretty safe one, which was really hard to understand, right? Especially when, look, I, the Commonwealth is a huge part of the monarchy and I lived in Canada, which is a Commonwealth country for seven years, but it wasn't until Harry and I were together that we started to travel through the Commonwealth. I would say 60, 70% of which is people of color, right? Mm -hmm. And growing up as a woman of color, as a little girl of color. Okay, well also, the whole Commonwealth was colonized. So I can't really say that all the, all the, the Commonwealth is places filled with people of color. Well, of course it is, because they were all colonized by the white man. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that because most of the Commonwealth is people of color, that that means the institution has to not be racist because the institution colonized that hundreds of years ago. I, I just don't think that logic follows. I know how important representation is. I know how you want to see someone who looks like you in certain positions. Obviously. Even, even Archie, like we read these books and now he's been, there's one line and one that goes, if you can see it, you can be it. And he goes, you can be it. And I think about that so often, especially in the context of these young girls, but even grown women and men who, when I would meet them in our time in the Commonwealth, how much it meant to them to be able to see someone who looks like them mm -hmm. in this position. Mm -hmm. And I could never understand how it wouldn't be seen as an added benefit mm -hmm. and a reflection of the world today at all times, but especially right now, to go, how inclusive is that, that you can see someone who looks like you in this family, much less one who's born into it? What was actually going on? Almost unsurvivable sounds like there was a breaking point. I just didn't see a solution. Marshall. Do you think this glacier will disappear in your lifetime? Probably. When you think of textbook evil, you think of Nazis. They wanted to create a strain on the country. To create a race war. Yes. And you wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. Journalism is important. Generations can look back and understand what was happening in these moments. That bird has been staring at me. It's been there for 10 minutes. Okay. I didn't know we were coming or I didn't wear pants. You changed the rules, sir. No objection, Your Honor. That's so intense. Yeah, welcome. Are you ready, Counselor? I am, Your Honor.
But then there's other days you actually get to make a difference. Those pictures, they mean something. Watch SWAT Wednesdays on CBS. When Megan joined the royal family in 2018, she became the target of unrelenting, pervasive attacks. Racist abuse online aimed at Meghan Markle. There were undeniable racist overtones. It stands apart from the kind of coverage we've seen of any other royal. There was constant criticism, blatant sexist and racist remarks by British tabloids and internet trolls. We have seen the racism towards her play out in real time. Referring to her as straight out of Compton. A daily onslaught of vitriol and condemnation from the UK press became overwhelming and in Megan's words, almost unsurvivable. You said in a podcast that it became almost unsurvivable. And that struck me because it sounds like you were in some kind of mental trouble. What was actually going on? Almost unsurvivable sounds like there was a breaking point. Yeah, there was. I just didn't see a solution. I would sit up at night and I was just like, I don't understand how all of this is being churned out. And again, I wasn't seeing it, but it's almost worse when you feel it through the expression of my mom or my friends or them calling me crying, just like, Meg, they're not protecting you. And I realized that it was all happening just because I was breathing. Mm. And look, I was really ashamed to say it at the time and ashamed to have to admit it to Harry, especially um, because I know how much loss he suffered. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I didn't say it, that I would do it. And I, I just didn't, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. And that was a very clear and real and frightening constant thought. And I remember, I remember how he just cradled me and I was, I went to the institution and I said that I needed to go somewhere to get help. So that I've never felt this way before and I need to go somewhere. And I was told that I couldn't, that it wouldn't be good for the institution. And I called. So the institution is never a person or is it a series of people? No, it's a person. It's a, a person. It's several people, but I went to one of the most senior people just to, to get help. And that, I feel like that has to be Charles because we all know Diana struggled mentally through the whole thing and he never helped her. And we all know Harry has said that he's had, you know, mental health struggles and that nobody ever helped him. And I just, I feel like that has to be Charles. I feel like it has to be Charles because she was just talking about how she loves the queen and how the queen is so nice to her. I feel like the queen would not have said that to her if they have a good relationship like that. It has to be Charles. You know, I, I, I share this because there's so many people who are afraid to voice that they need help. And I know personally how hard it is to not just voice it, but when you voice it, to be told no. And so I went to Human Resources and I said, I just really, I, I need help because in my old job, there was a union and they would protect me. And I remember this conversation like it was yesterday because they said, my heart goes out to you because I see how bad it is, but there's nothing we can do to protect you because you're not a paid employee of the institution. This wasn't a choice. This was emails and begging for help, saying very specifically, I am concerned for my mental welfare. And people go, oh yes, yes, it's disproportionately terrible what we see out there to anyone else, but nothing was ever done. So we had to find a solution. Wow. I don't want to be alive anymore. That's, that's heavy. Um... I'm sorry, baby. I'm sad I thought it would have solved everything for everyone, right? So were you thinking of harming yourself? Were you having suicidal thoughts? Yes. This was very, very clear. Wow. Very clear and very scary. And, you know, I didn't know who to even turn to in that. Mm. 
And one of the people that I reached out to who's continued to be a friend and confidant was one of um, my husband's mom's best friends, one of Diana's best friends, because it's like, who else could understand what's, what it's actually like on the inside? Did you ever think about going to a hospital or is that possible that you can check yourself in someplace? No, that's what I was asking to do. Yeah. You can't just do that. I couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. call an Uber <laughs> to the palace. Yeah. You couldn't just go. You couldn't. I mean, you have to understand as well, which when I joined that family, that was the last time until we came here that I saw my passport, my driver's license, my keys, all that gets turned over. I didn't see any of that anymore. Well, the way you're describing this, it, it's like you were trapped and couldn't get help, even though you're on the verge of suicide. That's what you are describing. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. And that would be an accurate interpretation. Yes. That's the truth. That's the truth. You know, and if you think about, it was one of the things that it still haunts me is this photograph that someone had sent me. We had to go to an official event. We had to go to this event um, at the Royal Albert Hall. And a friend said, I know you don't look at pictures, but oh my God, you guys look so great. Yeah. And sent it to me and I zoomed in and what I saw was the truth of what that moment was because right before we had to leave for that, I had just had that conversation with Harry that morning and it was the next day that I talked to the institution. Had the conversation, I don't want to be alive anymore. Yeah. Oof. No, and it was, it, it wasn't even, I don't want to, up, yeah. it was like, these are the thoughts that I'm having in yes. the middle of the night that are very clear and I'm scared mm -hmm. because this is very real. This mm -hmm. isn't some abstract idea. This is methodical and this is not who I am, mm -hmm. but we had to go to this event and I remember him saying, I don't think you can go. And I said, I can't be left alone. Because you were afraid of what you might do to yourself. And we went and that's so sorry to hear that and that picture if you zoom in what i see is how tightly his knuckles are gripped around mine you mm. can see the whites of our knuckles because we are smiling and doing our job but we're both just trying to hold on and every time that those lights went down in that royal box i was just weeping and he was gripping my hand and then wow. it was okay intermission's coming lights are about to come on everyone's looking at us again and you have to just be on again yeah um and that's i think so important for people to remember is you have no idea what's going on for someone behind closed doors you have that's no true. idea mm -hmm. even the people that smile the biggest smiles and shine the brightest lights it seems to have compassion for what's actually potentially going on you no know, the public is looking at you and to think that you earlier in the day had said to Harry that you didn't want to be alive anymore. Yeah, and just hours before, just sitting on the, the steps in our cottage, just sitting there and, and then going, okay, well, go upstairs and put your makeup bag in your sink and try to pull well, yourself together. Well, you have to go through that. And you know, Harry and I are working on this mental health series for yeah. Apple. And we, yeah, so we, 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 we hear a lot of these stories. Nobody should have to go through that. It takes so much courage to admit that you need help. Mm -hmm. It takes so much courage to voice that. As I said, I was ashamed. I'm supposed to be stronger than that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put more on my husband's shoulders. He's carrying the weight of the it's world. It's not about being I don't want strong. To bring that to him. I bring solutions. To admit that you need help, to admit how dark of a place you're in. Well, how do you feel about the palace hearing you speak your truth today? Are you afraid of, of a backlash or their reaction? Commercial. I'm Tina Butler. This is my husband, Cal. Okay, I'm gonna go get my makeup and I'm gonna start putting my makeup on because I have a lot of other errands I have to do today. But I promise I'm giving it my full attention. <laughs> Oh, 
from Look. I remember when Dr. Chen made us do that too. We put the no in November. The Neighborhood, Mondays on CBS. How do we ensure families facing food insecurity get access to their food? We needed to make sure that if they couldn't get to the food, the food would come to them. We can deliver for food banks and schools. Amazon knows how to do that. I've helped deliver 12 million meals to families in need. That's the power of having a company like Amazon behind me. Life is hard here. You're starting at the bottom again. No one likes you. Well, hold on to your life. some pretty shocking things here revealing wasn't planning to say anything shocking i'm just telling you what's happened okay <laughs> sorry for shocked you it's been a lot i'm a little shocked it's been a lot uh, well how do you feel about the palace hearing you speak your truth today are you afraid of, of a backlash or, 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 their, or their reaction i mean i think i'm not going to live my life in fear you know i think so much of it is said with an understanding of just truth mm -hmm. but i think to answer your question i don't know how they could expect that after all of this time we would still just be silent if there's an active role that the firm is playing in perpetuating falsehoods about us mm. that at a certain point you're going to go but you guys, someone just tell the truth. And if that comes with risk of losing things, I mean, I've, I've lost, there's a lot that's been lost already. Mm. And I grieve a lot. I mean, I've lost my father. I lost a baby. I nearly lost my name. I mean, there's the loss of identity, but I'm still standing. And my hope for people in the takeaway from this is to know that there's another side to know that life is worth living okay. i'm so glad you see that now we are going to take a break y'all and yep. harry's going to join us we'll be right back with harry so when i asked the question why did you leave the simplest answer is did you blindside the queen? Marshall. Still fresh. <laughs> Unstoppable in the wash scent booster. Down. Okay, so I think the biggest thing that they have not addressed yet is. Megan keeps talking about they weren't protecting me from the media. You know, they weren't coming out and saying these stories are fake. Um, I'm probably wrong, but I don't think they come out very often being like stories are fake because what's the point? But, and I know I think they're going to go on later to say they have this like invisible deal with the media that they only say certain things. And that might be true. But at the same time, the media is not the royal family. Like as many deals as they may or may not have with them, the media still, it's their job to write stories on 
people that are in the public eye and no one is more in the public eye than the royal family like the royal family is one of the most talked about people in britain like you can't expect stories not to be written about them so i feel like yes they should could and should have come out and denied certain things but also certain stories they can't control hi hello thanks for joining us thanks for having me been watching on the side yeah, sorry. yes <laughs> i want to say first of all let's say congratulations <laughs> for the new addition to your family megan said she wanted to wait until you were here to tell us is it a boy or is it a girl you can tell her no no it's a girl it's a girl oh, yeah. you're gonna have a daughter that and saw it on the ultrasound what 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 was your first thought amazing just grateful like any to have any child any one or any two would have been amazing but to have a boy and then a girl you know what more can you ask for but now you know now we've, we've, we've got our family we got you know the four of us and our two dogs and yeah. done it's great done two is it Gone. Two is it. Two is it. Two is it. And when's the baby due? It's summertime. It's summertime. Yeah. Um, so you all have been living in sunny California now for uh since March. Since March, okay. In late twenty nineteen. March is when we went into lockdown. How do they do that? Left the UK and moved to Canada. The couple says they chose Canada, a Commonwealth of Britain with the intention of continuing to serve the Queen. After their move, Harry and Meghan say security, normally provided by the royal family, was cut off. By March 2020, just days before the COVID lockdown began, Meghan, Harry and Archie relocated to Los Angeles, where media mogul Tyler Perry offered them his home as a temporary refuge. He also provided security. Three months later, they bought their own home and settled in the Santa Barbara area. Last spring, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex created their own foundation and media content company called Archwell. And so you stayed at Tyler Perry's house for several months. Yeah, because we didn't have a plan. We, yeah. need, we needed a house and he offered his yeah. security as well. So we, it gave us breathing room to try to figure out what we were going to do. The biggest concern was that we were, we were in Canada in someone else's house. Um, I then got told, short notice, that security was going to be removed. By this point, courtesy of the Daily Mail, the world knew exact, our exact location. So suddenly it dawned on me, hang on a second, the borders could be closed, we're going to have our security removed, but who knows how long lockdown's going to be. The world knows where we are. It's not safe. It's not secure. We're not we secure. probably need to get so out of Okay, that is scary as fuck, because... Most celebrities, you know, your address is not private information because you're a public person, but to have your entire address leaked and then not have any security to make sure that people aren't just, you know, coming up to your house and breaking in and doing God knows what, like that's scary as fuck. And that sketch is fuck. Like, why would they do that? What security did you have at the time that was going to be removed? Uh, we had our UK security. So you got word from overseas that we're taking away your security. Why were they doing that? Their justification is a change in status. Um, of which I pushed back and said, well, is there a change of threat or risk? Um, and after many weeks of waiting, eventually I got the confirmation that no, the risk and threat hasn't changed. But due to our change of status, which we would no longer be a official working members of the royal family, though obviously what we proposed was sort of part time or at least as much as we could do without being fully consumed because of I think what most of you guys have covered already. And we actually didn't talk about that. That you know, it's been so spun in the wrong direction. So we quit. We walked away. We all the conversations of the two years before we finally announced it. In January 2020, Prince Harry and Meghan announced they would step back as senior members of the royal family. The swiftness with which they've taken this decision only 18 months after they got married has taken everyone by surprise from the Queen all the way down. The 
bombshell news sparked a worldwide media frenzy, dubbed Megxit by the British press. Many reporters and viral posts blamed Megan for the decision. Megan knew what she was signing up for. She's being eviscerated. Harry, how does the Duchess go in the future? In an official statement, Queen Elizabeth said, although we would have preferred them to remain full-time working members of the royal family, we respect and understand their wish to live a more independent life as a family while Do remaining you know? a valued part of my family. Okay, let me ask the question. Yeah. So over a year ago, uh, you shocked the world. You announced that you're stepping back as uh, senior members of the royal family. And then the media reported that you had blindsided the queen, your grandmother. So here's a time to set the record straight. What was the tipping point? that made you decide you had to leave? I was desperate. I went to all the places which I thought I should go to to ask for help. We both did, mm -hmm. separately and together. So you left because you were asking for help and couldn't get it? Yeah, basically. But we never left. <laughs> we never left the family and we only wanted to have the same type of role that exists, right? There's senior members of the family and then they're non-senior members. As we said specifically, we're stepping back from senior roles to be just like several, I mean, I can think of so many right now who are all their royal highnesses, prince or princess, duke or duchess, who earn a living, live on palace grounds, can support the queen if and when called upon. Mm -hmm. So we weren't reinventing the wheel here. We were saying, okay, if this isn't working for everyone, we're in a lot of pain. You can't provide us with the help that we need. We can just take a step back we can do it in a Commonwealth country. We've suggested New Zealand, South Africa, take a breath. Canada. Yeah. yeah. And, and you wanted to take a breath from what specifically? Let's be clear. From this, this, this constant barrage. My biggest concern was history repeating itself. And I've said that before on numerous occasions, very publicly. Um, and what I was seeing was history repeating itself, but more perhaps, or definitely far more dangerous because then you add race in and you add social media in. When I'm talking about history of being yourself, I'm talking about my, my mother. When you can see something happening in the same kind of way, anybody would ask for help, ask the, the, the system of which you are part of, mm. um, especially when you know there's a relationship there that they could help and share some truth or call, call the dogs off, whatever you want to call it. So to receive no help at all and to be told continuously, this is how it is, this is just how it is, We've all been through it. And I think the biggest turning point for me was the, and it didn't take very long, so it was actually right at the beginning, was, okay, this, this union, us, me being, having a girlfriend, was going to be a thing. Of course it was. But I, I never expected or I never thought- Because she was a mixed race? No, just, just the two of us to start with. I hadn't really thought about the mixed race piece because I thought, well, well, firstly, you know, I've spent many years doing the work mm -hmm. and doing my own learning. But the, my upbringing and the system of which I was brought up in and what I've been exposed to, it wasn't, a, I wasn't aware of it to start with. But my God, it doesn't take very long to suddenly become aware of it. Yeah, because you said you really weren't aware of unconscious bias and no. what that represents until you met me. Yeah, you know, so as it is to say, it, it takes living in her shoes in this instance for a day or those first eight days to see where it was going to go and how far they were going to take it. And get away with it. And get away with it and be so blatant about it. That's the bit that shocked me. This is, we're talking about the UK press here, right? And this, and the, the UK is my home. That is, that is where I was brought up. So yes, I've got my own relationship. Um, that goes back a long way uh, with the media. I, I asked for calm from the British tabloids, once as a boyfriend, once as a husband, and then once as a father. So when I ask the question, why did you leave? The simplest answer is? Lack of support and lack of understanding. So I want clarity was the move about getting away from the UK press, because the press is, you know, is everywhere, or was the move because you weren't getting enough support from the firm? It was both. Both. Yeah. 
Did you blindside the queen? No. I've never blindsided my grandmother. I have too much respect for her. Um, so where did that story come from? Um, I hazard a guess that it probably could have come from within the institution. Yes, I remember when you talked to her several times about this over... Two years. <laughs> two years, but even the night before, days before, with the statement coming out, I remember that conversation. So and how her. do you know she wasn't blindsided? Because the way it was like, presented through the press is that suddenly you made this announcement, she didn't know it was coming. No, I, I, when we were in Canada, I, I had uh, two conversations with my grandmother and two conversations with my father um, before he stopped taking my calls. And then said, can you put this all in writing, what your plan is? Your father asked you to put it in writing? Yeah, uh, he asked me to put it in writing. I put all the specifics in there, even the fact that we were planning on putting the announcement out on the 7th of January. So you just said that your dad stopped taking your calls. Why did he stop taking your calls? Because I took matters in, by that point, I took matters into my own hands. It was like, I need to do this for my family. This is not a surprise to anybody. It's really sad that it's got to this point, but I've got to do something for my own mental health, for my wife's, um, and for, for Archie's as well, because I could see where this was headed. I think what we really have got to clear up here is that you, Megan, are the one who manipulated, calculated this Mexit. Well, just the fact that Charles is not taking his calls anymore just screams to me that he's the one that said the comment about you can't get mental health. He's the one that said the comment about the skin color. It just right there. That just proves it to me right there. I feel like. I just really feel like Harry is Diana's son and William is Charles's. And I'm not saying that to be mean to William because I actually do really like William and Kate. Catherine, William and Catherine. I do really like them. It's just, you know, they named their daughter Charlotte after Charles. And I w it would not shock me if Harry and Meghan named their daughter Diana. It just really wouldn't because I think William forgave his dad a long time ago and Harry never did and he didn't understand how William did. And then when all this started to happen to Meghan, Harry was just like, so it's basically the same thing again and nobody's gonna help me protect her because dad wouldn't protect our mom, but you're okay with that to William. And I think that's what the big issue is overall, but we'll see how the rest of the interview is. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating class money to get by. Uh, it's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. I've come up with a plan on how to kill her husband. Never. We've sat back and not said that for so long. It just feels really to have been silent. Yeah. All you, this time. It's yeah. been three and a half, four years. Or longer actually. Well, we were saying, you know, it, gosh, it must have been years ago. We were sitting in Nottingham I was sitting in Nottingham Cottage and the little mermaid came on. Uh -huh. now, who, who as an adult really watches the little mermaid? But it came on, I was like, well, I I'm just here all the time, so I may as well watch this. And I went, oh my god. She falls in love with a prince, and because of that, she has to lose her voice. But by the end, she gets her voice back. It's her voice back. And this is what happened. Here. Okay, The Little Mermaid's my favorite movie, so you gotta love her for that. So you're stepping back out of frustration, and you just need to get out. And, you know, you heard Megan share with us all the moment that she came to you had the courage enough to say out loud, I don't want to live anymore. And you didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I went, I went to a very dark place as well. But I, 
and I, I wanted to be there for her. Um, so we didn't leave right at that moment, moment right? Yeah. We didn't. We still. Oh, that's almost a year after. So did, did you tell other people in the family I need to get help for her? We need help for no. her. That's just not a conversation that would be had. Wow. Um, I guess I was ashamed of admitting it to them. Oh. And I don't know whether I don't know whether they've had the same whether they've had the same feelings or thoughts. I have no idea. Um, it's a very trapping environment that a lot of them are stuck in. You were ashamed of admitting that Megan needed help. Yeah. Well, our society has made it a shameful um, thing to say you need help. Got some very close friends that Let alone being royal. Being with us through this whole process. Mm -hmm. But for the family, they very much have this mentality of this is just how it is. This is how it's meant to be. You can't change it. We've all been through it. We've all been through the pressure. We've all been through the yes. But what was different? Exploited. From, what was different for me was the race element, because now it wasn't just about her. It was about what she represents, and therefore it wasn't just affecting my wife. It was affecting so many other people as well. And that's that was the trigger for me to really engage in those conversations with palace senior palace staff and with my family to say, guys, this is not going to end well. And when you say end well, what did you mean? For anyone, it's not going to end well. Because the way that I saw it was, there is a way of doing things, but for us, for this union and the specifics around her race, it was an opportunity, many opportunities, for my family to show some public support. And I guess one of the most telling parts, the saddest parts, I guess, was over 70 members of parliament, female members of parliament, both conservative and labor came out and called out the, the colonial undertones of articles and headlines written about Meghan. Yet no one from my family ever said anything over those three years. That, that hurts. But I also am acutely aware of where my family stand and how scared they are of the tabloids turning on them. Turning on them for what? They're the royal family. Yes, but it's um, there is this invisible, what's, what's, what's termed or referred to as the invisible contract behind closed doors uh, between the institution and the tabloids, UK tabloids. How so? Well, it is, a, to simplify it, it's a, it's, a, it's a case of if you, if you as a family member are willing to wine, dine, and give full access to these reporters, uh, then you will get better press. Why do you care about better press if you're royal? I think everyone needs to have some compassion for, for them in that situation, right? There is a level of control by fear that has existed for generations. I mean, generations who's controlling whom? Mm. It's the institution from our point of view, just the public, it's... Yeah, it's, but the institution survives based on that, on that perception. So you're so saying actually, there's this know. relationship that, that Megan was speaking of, it's like symbiotic. One lives or thrives because the other exists. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. That's, that's the idea. Well, and so, I mean, I think there's a reason that these tabloids have holiday parties at the palace. They're hosted by the palace. The tabloids are. You know, there is a construct that's at play there. And because from the beginning of our relationship, they were so attacking and inciting so much racism, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changed our the risk level because it, went, it wasn't just catty gossip. It was bringing out a part of people that was racist in how it was charged. Mm -hmm. And that changed the threat, that changed the level of death threats, that changed everything. Mm -hmm. So tell me this, you said a moment ago, it hurts that your family has never acknowledged the role that racism played in here. Did you think she was well received in the beginning? Yes, far better than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, my, my grandmother has been amazing throughout. Um, you know, my father, my brother, Kate, and, and all the rest of the family, they were, they were, they were really welcoming. But it really changed after the Australia tour after our South Pacific tour. That's when we announced we were pregnant with Archie as our first tour. But it was also it was also the first time that the family got to see how incredible she is at the job. And that brought back memories. 
I'm thinking because I watch The Crown, okay? I watch The Crown. Do you all watch The Crown? <laughs> I've watched some of it. Have you watched some of it? I've watched some of it. But there's this, uh, I think it was the fourth season, actually, where there's an Australian tour. So is that what you're talking about? It brought back memories of that? The Australian tour yeah. where your father and your mother went there and your mother was bedazzling? So are you saying that there were hints of jealousy? Look, I... I just wish that we would all learn from the past. Okay, so I think the issue here is I think the issue with Charles and Diana was Charles didn't want to be outshined by Diana, but Charles has never been a really popular guy because he's always been kind of a snot nozzle. So Diana came on and she's this young, beautiful, vibrant person who's going to bring in all of this approval that Charles doesn't have, but then Charles is jealous of it because he's like, but I'm the one with the title. I'm the future king. Why don't they love me and they love you, this girl that I don't even love, that I was made to marry, but they love you, but they don't love me, but I don't love you. That's the thing because you don't want somebody who is not going to be the next king or queen to be outshined by somebody else because it's supposed to be the monarch, the next monarch, and the next one that gets the attention because they're the ones that are going to be that head of state. They're the ones that are going to be in the forefront. So you want them to before that be in the forefront so that people before they get seated on the throne already have a good relationship with the public, the tabloids, and they already have a good rep rep reputation. Charles did not have that, but Diana was building it, but it was for Diana and it wasn't for Charles or the monarchy. And I think that's where they really had the issue with her because even though it wasn't her intention, she was drawing it to herself and not to the monarchy. And I think that's what the jealousy comes from with them because even though it was negative, Meghan continued to get so much press and people really liked her because she was new it was exciting for other people of color to see her in this role, but then they were kind of being perceived more and better than William and Catherine. But William and Catherine are gonna be the next king and queen, like you can't. So I think that's where, the, where it comes from is they didn't want the people who are not going to be that head of state to be getting all of this good attention. So they always tried to divert it even though they shouldn't, they shouldn't just let it be because, you know, good press is good press. Like, why argue over who's getting better press or who's getting more press? Because if you're all a family, it's all together. So, I mean, I don't know. But to see, the, to see how effortless it was for Meghan to come into the family so quickly in Australia and across New Zealand, Fiji and Tonga, and just being able to connect with people in okay. such a, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, but it's. Why, I mean, why wouldn't everybody love that? Isn't that what you want? You want her to come into the family and to, as the queen said at one point, the way that Megan had basically, yeah. not her words, but assimilated into the family. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as, as we talked about, you know, she was very much welcomed into the family, not just by the family, but by the world, yeah. certainly by the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you have one of the greatest assets to the Commonwealth that the family could mm -hmm. have ever wished for. I just can't, I'm kind of going back to this. So then you're in Canada because you had stepped back, your firm says you're no longer going to have protection. So did you ask for that because did you want, were you trying to have it both ways? You wanted to step back, but also keep your foot in royal business, it it's, seems. It's interesting that you talk about it being, you know, uh, have it both ways. On the, on the security element, I never thought that I would have my security removed because I was born into this position. I inherited the risk. Mm -hmm. So that was a shock to me. That was what completely changed the whole plan. Not so that we had you a plan. as Prince Harry, yeah. Mm -hmm. are going to have your security removed. Yeah. 
and I even and I even wrote letters to his family saying, please, it's it's very clear the protection of me or Archie is not a priority. I accept that. That is fine. Please keep my husband safe. I see the death threats. I see the racist propaganda. Please keep him safe. Mm. Please don't pull his security and announce to the world when he and we are most vulnerable. And they said it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. I think what we really have got to clear up here is because one of the stories that continues to live either through rumors or social media out in the world is that you, Megan, are the one who manipulated, calculated, and are responsible for this Megxit. Oh my gosh. It's and amazing how they can use Meg for everything. Yes. There are even stories that you knew all along that this was going to happen. You went through the whole process and it was all intentional to build your brand. Can you imagine how little sense that makes? I left my career, my life. I left everything because I love him, right? And our plan was to do this forever. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Our plan yes. for me, I mean, I wrote mm -hmm. letters to his family when I got there saying, I am dedicated to this. I'm here for you. Use me as you'd like. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There were certain things that you couldn't do, but you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That might exist for other members of the family. That was not something that was offered to me. So nobody tells you anything? No. Nobody prepares you. No, I mean uh, it's nobody even down yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. No one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling, how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. I don't want to embarrass them. I need to learn these 30 mm -hmm. hymns for a church. All of this is televised. We were doing the training behind the scenes because I just wanted to make them proud. Okay, but here's the question. Do you think you would have left or ever stepped back were it not for Megan? Mm. No, right? the answer to your question is no. I you would not have. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been able to because I. Well, what reason would he have without Megan? I mean, people make it seem like she did it vindictively for whatever reason, and I'm like, I don't think it was vindictive. But if he had married, you know, his ex girlfriend Chelsea, this white girl who was British who knew it already, they would have had a really easy go of it. So no, they probably would have never have had to have left. But it's not because Megan made them leave. It's because her being who she is made that life not sus sustainable for her, which then made it not sustainable for them. I myself was trapped as well. I didn't see she a way out. You felt trapped? You were trapped? Yeah, I didn't see a way out. But you've had this life your whole life. This has been your life your whole life. Yeah, but, you know, I was trapped when I didn't know I was trapped. Hmm. But the moment that I met Meg, and then our worlds sort of collided in the most amazing of ways. And then to see how the Please race- Please explain how you, Prince Harry, raised in a palace, in a life of privilege, literally a prince, how you were trapped. Trapped within the system, like the rest of my family are. My father and my brother, they are trapped. They don't get to leave. And I have huge compassion for that. Well, okay, so the, the impression of the world, maybe it's a, a false impression, is that for all these years before Megan, you were living your life as a royal Prince Harry, the beloved Prince Harry, mm -hmm. and that you were enjoying that life. We don't get the impression that you were feeling trapped in that life. Enjoying the life because there were photographs of me smiling while I was shaking hands and meeting people. Like, I'm sure you guys have covered some of that that's that's a part of the job that's a part of the role that's what's expected no matter who you are in the family no matter what's going on in your personal life no matter what's just happened if the bikes roll up and the car rolls up you gotta get dressed you gotta get in there you wipe the tears away shake off whatever you're thinking about and you gotta be on your end game mm -hmm. what do you think your mom would say about this stepping back this decision to step back from the royal family how would she feel about this moment? I think she would feel very angry with how this has panned out and very sad. But ultimately, all she'd, ever, all she'd ever want is for us to be happy. Megan shared with us that there was a conversation with you 
about Archie's skin tone. What was that conversation? So I will say one thing about Oprah. I don't like the way she was coming at him just now about how could you feel trapped? Because I think that's the way a lot of people look at rich people too. Because just because you have money does not mean you're happy, does not mean you're not suicidal, does not mean you are not lonely, does not mean you can just do willy nilly whatever you want. I mean, maybe in America it means that, but you know, I can fully believe that as a working royal, he felt trapped because yes, it's all he's ever known, but it's all he's ever known. So he's never known, you know, the days of going to college, going to wild parties and waking up naked on somebody's lawn the next day because you just drank too much and whatever. You know, he's never been to Mexico on spring break and just got plastered. And he's never done those things that we do every day and take for granted. Like he never, he didn't go with his dad to go get his driver's license when he turned 16. You know, he's never had those car crashes that everybody is eventually going to have. He's never had all those things that people get. And you don't realize what you're missing until somebody shows it to you, you know? So like, I can believe how he was felt trapped because, you know, he can't do what he wants. He couldn't stay in the military when he wanted to. He had to get out. He has to do whatever the queen says whenever she says to do it. And he has to do it with a smile on his face. Like it doesn't matter. Like he can't call in sick to royal duties, you know? Like, so I really understand how he might feel trapped. And I just didn't appreciate how Oprah was kind of like, you're a prince, how can you feel trapped? Anybody can be trapped in any situation. What's my name, Nigeria woman in tears. The process will be very stressful and unpleasant. Because of a white guy? That does not help. Let's laugh together. Bob Hart's Abishola, Mondays on CBS. You wanted freedom from, from that life. You wanted freedom to make your own money. You wanted freedom to make deals with Netflix and Spotify, but you also wanted to yeah. serve the queen. No, we didn't, want to, we didn't want to give up or we didn't want to turn our backs on the, the associations and the people that, we, mm -hmm. that we've been supporting. But also, oh, it, it, but, it exists. Yeah, it exists. But also, but also the, the Netflix and the Spotify of it all, that was never part of the plan. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have a plan. We didn't we have, have a plan. plan. That, was, that was suggested by somebody else by the by the point where my family literally cut me off financially and I had to afford to afford security for, for us. Wait, hold, hold up, wait a minute. Your family cut you off? Yeah, in the first half, the first quarter of 2020. But I've got what my mum left me. And yeah. without that, we would not have been able to do this. Okay. So, you know, touching back on what you asked him, what my mum would think of this. I think she saw it coming. And I certainly felt her presence throughout this whole process. And I'm, you know, for me, I'm, I'm just really relieved and happy to be sitting here talking to you with my wife by my side. Because I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for her going through this process by herself all those yeah. years ago, because it has been unbelievably tough for the two of us, but at least we had each other. What's your relationship like now with your family? I've spoken more, more to my grandmother in the last year than I have done for many, many years. Do you all Zoom calls? Uh, we did a couple of Zoom calls with Archie. Yes, I can see yeah. Archie. Yeah. Um, my grandmother and I have a, a really good relationship mm -hmm. and an understanding, and I have a deep respect for her. She's my cousin in chief, mm -hmm. right? Um, she always will be. Your relationship with your father? He's not taking his calls. Is he taking your calls now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. Um, there's a lot to work through there. You know, I, I feel really let down because he's been through something similar. He knows what pain feels like. And this is, and Archie's his grandson. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, of course, I will, I will always, I will always love him. But there's a lot of hurt that's happened, and and I will continue to to make it one of my priorities to try and heal that.
relationship. Um, but they only know what they know. And that's the thing. I've tried to... Or what they're told. Or what they're told. And I've tried to educate them through the process that I have been educated. Because is it like being in a big royal bubble? Yeah. Yeah. And your brother relationship? Much has been said about that. Yeah, and, and much will continue to be said about that. You know, I, I, as I said before, you know, I, I love William to bits. He's my brother. We've been through hell together. And we have a shared experience. But we, you know, we were, on, we were on different paths. Well, what is particularly striking is what Megan shared with us earlier, is that no one wants to admit that there's anything about race or that race has played a role in the trolling and the vitriol. And yet, Megan shared with us that there was a conversation with you about Archie's skin tone. Mm -hmm. What was that conversation? That conversation <laughs> I am never going to share. Um, but at the time, at the time it was awkward. I was a bit shocked. Um, can, you, can you tell us what the question was? No, I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, but that was that was right at the beginning, right? Um, like, what will the baby look like? Yeah, what will the kids look like? Yeah, what will yeah. the kids look like? But um, that was right at the beginning when she wasn't going to get security, when members of my family were, su were suggesting that she carries on acting because there's not enough money to pay for her and all this sort of stuff. Like, there were some real obvious signs before we even got married that this was going to be really hard. Mm. So in conclusion, if you'd had the support, you'd still be there? Without question. Yeah. I'm sad that, that what's happened has happened, mm. but I know and I'm comfortable knowing that we did everything that we could to make it work. And we did everything on the exit process the way that, that, the way that it should have been With done. With as much respect. With as much and, respect. Oh my God, we just did everything we could to, pr to protect yeah. them. So what do you say to the people who say mm -hmm. that you came here, you made these multi-million dollar deals and that you were just money grabbing royals? First off, this was never the intention. Yeah. Um, and we're certainly not complaining. We've our life is great now. We've got a beautiful house. We've got a beautiful. I've got a beautiful family. Um, the dogs. <laughs> the dogs are really happy. Um, but at the time during COVID, the suggestion by a friend was, "What about streamers?" Yeah, and we like, genuinely hadn't thought of it. Before. Never thought about it. Um, so there was all sorts of different options. And look, from my perspective, all I needed was enough money to be able to pay for security to keep my family safe. How will you use Archwell as a means of speaking to things that are important to you in the world? I think in creating, I mean, life is about storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. About the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we're told, what we buy into, and, and for us to be able to have storytelling through a truthful lens that hopefully is uplifting. It's gonna be great um, knowing how many people that that can land with and being able to give a voice to a lot of people that are underrepresented and aren't really heard. Any regrets? Marshall, but we're nearing the end of this. Um, and I think, I think the main thing that is going on is, you know, the royal family didn't do enough to stop the media from just attacking them or they used them to cover other things, which I kind of feel like is dumb because Megan is a part of the family, you know, so if she looks bad, the whole family looks bad. So I don't understand why at the beginning they wouldn't have protected her, whether they had an issue with her race or not, she was still a part of the family. So you should still protect her because protecting her protects the family as a whole. Um, I definitely believe Charles is still a villain. Always has been, always will be. Um, and I really think we're just going to have to see how the palace responds to this, you know, and I really hope Prince Philip does not die.
tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, everybody's really worried he's gonna die like soon, soon. Um, he's almost 100, so maybe. Um, and I guess we'll just, we just have to see what they say, what happens. Because, I mean, anything could happen at this point, really. Jump on all eyes. Being a judge means being patient and fair. Don't blink now. It's a new year, and maybe we should start doing things differently. The court, in fact, abused its power. I need to attack the court. In the interest of justice, oh. that's all. Never boring, Carmichael. We all just have to keep the faith. Watch All Rise, Mondays on CBS. This morning, I woke up earlier than H and saw um, a note from someone in our team in the UK saying that the Duke of Edinburgh had gone to the hospital. Yeah. But I just picked up the phone and I, I called the Queen just to check in. You call. check in. You just check. like, I, you know, I would, that's what we do. It's like being able to default to not having to every moment go, is that appropriate? Yeah. For so many of my family, what they do is there's a level of control in that, right? Yeah. Because they're fearful of what the papers are going to say about them. Yeah. Whereas with us, it was just like, just be, just be yourself, just be genuine, just be mm -hmm. authentic, just go and do what, what is necessary. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. If you get it right, you get it right. On February 19th, 2021, Buckingham Palace released a statement announcing it was agreed that Prince Harry and Meghan would not return as working members of the royal family. Harry and Meghan's royal patronages and Prince Harry's honorary military titles would be returned to the Queen. The Queen's statement was released after our interview took place. Your exit agreement with the royal family, it, it, that is well, that's up disappointing. at the end of this month. I wish that we had gotten to see their reaction in this interview to what the Queen's statement was because they released a statement right after being like, you can always live a life of service. And a lot of people felt like there was kind of like backhanding what the Queen said, but I guess we won't know because that happened after this was filmed. The decision is, I think that, yeah, I mean, the decision that well, as of last week or whatever it was, um, is that they will be removing everything. Are you hurt by that decision? I am hurt, but at the same time, I completely respect my grandmother's decision. I would still love for us to be able to continue to support those associations, yeah. albeit without the title or the role. Could you be as satisfied now doing this through your own organization, Archwell? Well, yeah, this is what we're doing, right? We're still doing it. Yeah. We're still going to always do the work. But I also think it's important for you or everyone to know this decision that was made about patronages and all of that was before anyone knew that we were sitting down with you. Yeah. I think that it's, I can only imagine that- Well, oh, I heard a story that the, you're getting punished. Now, those were being taken away because you did sit down with yeah, but that was, I mean, those well, letters, those conversations, that was, that was finalized before anyone even knew that we were going to sit down. So that's just not true. All right. Yeah. Tell me this, Harry. What delights you now in your everyday experience and the things that you actually cherish in your life here with Archie <laughs> and Megan? Um, this year has been crazy for everybody. Um, but to have outdoor space where I can go for walks with Archie and we can go for walks as a family and with the dogs and be able to go to the hikes or go you know, down to the beach, which is so close. All of these things are just, I guess the highlight for me mm. is sticking him on the back of the bicycle in his little baby seat and taking him on these bike rides or something which I never was able to do when I was young. I can see him on the back. And he's got his arms out and he's like, ooh, chatting, 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 going palm tree, house, and then all this sort of stuff. And, and I do, I think myself, What's his wow. new favorite word? What's his favorite word now? Oh my gosh, he's on a roll. In um, the past couple of weeks, it has been hydrate, which is just a But also whenever anyone leaves the house, he's like, drive safe. Drive safe. Drive safe. Which is really, which is really it's not even two yet. You said that your brother was trapped. You said that you love your brother and always will love your brother. You didn't tell me what the relationship is now, though. Um, the relationship is space at the moment. And, you know, time heals all things, hopefully. 
any regrets? No, I mean, no, I, I think we've done, I'm really proud of us. You know, um, I'm so proud of, I'm so proud of my wife. Like she safely delivered Archie during a period of time, which was so cruel and so mean. And every single day I was coming back from work from London, I was coming back to my wife crying while breastfeeding Archie. Mm. That's coming from someone who wasn't reading anything. And as you touched on earlier, if she hadn't read anything, she wouldn't be here now. So we did what we had to do. And now we've got another little one on the way. I have one. My regret is believing them when they said I would be protected. I believe that. And I regret believing that because I think had I really seen that that wasn't happening, I would have been able to do more. But I think I wasn't supposed to see it. I wasn't supposed to know. And, and now, because we're actually on the other side, we've actually not just survived, but are thriving. You know, this, I mean, just miracles. I, yeah, I think that all of those things that I was hoping for have happened. Um, and this is in some ways just the beginning for us. You know, we've been through a lot. It's felt like a lifetime, <laughs> a lifetime. So your story with the prince does have a happy ending. It does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really it has a happy ending because you made it so yeah greater than any fairy tale you've ever read yeah greater than any fairy yes. tale what do you describe to today being trapped and not even being aware of it and all the things that have transpired and then she comes into your life and then you're doing therapy do you think in some way she saved you yeah with without question there was there was a bigger purpose there was other forces at play, I think, throughout this whole process. I'm the last person to think, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's undeniable when these things have happened, where the overlap is. So, yeah, she did, um, without, yeah, without question, she saved. I would, I would, I mean, I, I think that's lovely. I would disagree. I think he saved all of us. I mean, he ultimately called it and was like, we've got to find a way for us, for Archie, and you made a decision that saved, well, certainly saved my life um, and saved all of us. But you know, you need to want to be saved. Well, thank you for sharing your love story. We can't wait for the big day sometime yes, this summer. Yes, indeed. Sometime this summer. Yeah. Thank you both for trusting me to share your story. Thank you for giving us the space to do it. No, thank you. This conversation doesn't end here. There was so much more that we couldn't fit into this special. Join me tomorrow as I share more exclusive moments and discuss reaction around the world with Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. See you then. Okay, well, I think that was a really well done um, interview. It all came across very polite respectful but just like I need to speak my truth type of thing um I do still as I've said think it was mostly Charles that caused the issues um and I know that there's like a secret agreement or whatever with them in the press but I also feel like the press is going to do what the press wants to do and nobody can really stop them from doing what they want to do so I feel like it might have been half and half you know like half the palace could have done more you know come out more publicly be like oh well that's not true but then half the media was just being the media and wanting to be that way because they want to sell as many papers as they can and the best way to do that is to write headlines that are going to get the most attention so i feel like we shouldn't lay blame entirely on the monarchy just like oh the monarchy needs to be abolished blah blah, blah. the monarchy's so bad because the last time a monarchy was abolished you know, um, the Russians, they were all brutally murdered, including their kids. The Greeks were all kicked out of their country and less, left destitute. You know, Philip, he's 
a son of the Greek monarchy and his family was kicked out and they were left destitute and like, you know, like, I don't really know what happened to some of them. I think some of them are now back in Greece, but not in like a royal capacity. Um, but I do feel like some things need updates, but also at the same time, a lot of it is old school tradition. That's going to be really hard to break down those walls and you can't just expect it to just happen. But um, I don't think absolving the monarchy is or abolishing the monarchy is the right thing to do but I don't really know how you could fix any of that but I do think it was a really good interview um there's a lot of good things to talk about and a lot of things that I didn't really agree with or have a different opinion on but I think everybody's going to be that way but um I will see you guys in my next video